Well, hi there. Welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I am Nurse Mo, and as always, I am really happy that you are spending your precious free time with me today. We're going to be talking about blood transfusions. So before we dive into that, I want to take a minute and give a quick listener shout out to Rebecca, who took the time to write in and share this. Rebecca says, This is by far the best nursing school-related podcast that I have come across. I am so very thankful to have found Nurse Mo. I'm a faithful podcast listener and also a member of the Crucial Concepts Boot Camp, and I have a straight nursing planner. I guess you could say I am completely prepared to start my nursing school program in two weeks. But what I love the most about the podcast is how I feel that I'm able to incorporate learning into so many other activities that I do on a daily basis. I do a lot of traveling by car, and so I have been looking forward to it so I can fill that time with podcast episodes. I feel so confident and feel like I am starting my nursing program on such a solid foundation, and I'm so thankful. The boot camp has been invaluable, and I feel so unbelievably confident with dosage calculations. Thank you, Nurse Mo, for everything that you do and for all the time that you put into your amazing content. I can't wait to go through nursing school with you. So Rebecca, thank you so much. I can't wait to go through nursing school with you also. And I really appreciate that you took the time to write and share that. It absolutely made my day. Okay, so let's dive into our topic, talking about transfusing blood. And transfusing blood products is a high, high risk procedure that requires very careful attention to detail and excellent patient assessment skills. So for this reason, Anytime you administer blood products, you will be doing this along with another RN to ensure that all the safety checks have been conducted, and we'll talk about those in a bit. So whether you're a nurse who's wanting to boost your confidence in this area or a student who's getting ready for a transfusion checkoff or nervous about that, this episode is a great way to review the key things that you need to know. So the first thing that I want to review with you are the different types of blood products. So blood products is going to refer to anything that is infused as a replacement for components of that hematologic system. So the basic item is whole blood. So this is going to be blood that has all the original elements present. It's not actually used that routinely because most of the time blood products are separated out into individual components so that patients can get just the blood products that they need. However, whole blood may be administered in trauma situations or in cases where patients have massive bleeding for some other reason, and these patients would benefit from all the volume that is provided from both the red blood cells and the plasma. Plus, plasma has a lot of other great stuff in it, like clotting factors. One unit of whole blood contains approximately 450 to 500 mils volume, okay? So quite a bit. And then we have packed red blood cells or PRBCs, and this is what you'll mostly be transfusing. This is going to be blood with most of that plasma removed, and it generally is used to restore oxygen carrying capacity and improve tissue perfusion when the hemoglobin is low. So typically in the clinical setting, packed red cells are indicated when the hemoglobin is at about a level of 7 or below. Though, of course, this could vary depending on the patient clinical presentation. If they're actively bleeding and we don't see any sign to that bleeding ending, we're not going to wait till the hemoglobin drops really low to start transfusing blood. But in general, with your chronic, like say your chronic anemia patient, for example, we generally don't get too, too excited about that anemia until it gets to around that seven range or when the patient starts to get symptomatic. One unit of packed red blood cells typically has between 250 and 300 mils of volume. And then we have leukocyte-reduced red blood cells. So this is blood that has had the leukocytes, or the white blood cells, removed. Each unit of whole blood or packed red blood cells contains a lot 
of white blood cells, between 2 and 5 billion. And these white blood cells can cause a variety of adverse reactions, including transmission of cytomegalovirus. It can cause human leukocyte alloimmunization. It can cause febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reactions. There can even be the transmission of bacteria in some cases and other inflammatory reactions. So patients who are at high risk for experiencing one or more of these adverse effects will likely receive leukocyte-reduced blood. This would include patients with leukemia, patients who are severely immunocompromised for any reason, such as those going through chemotherapy, for example, patients who have received a transplant, including a bone marrow transplant, patients who get chronic blood transfusions, they're going to be at higher risk, patients who've had a previous febrile non-hemolytic transfusion reaction, and patients having cardiac surgery. And then we have platelets. Platelets is a blood product that has been separated from the whole blood by apheresis. Platelets will be administered to patients who have thrombocytopenia and are at risk for bleeding or actively bleeding. Many times, platelets will be administered before an invasive procedure. Let's say you have a patient whose platelet count is lowish and they need to have a central line placed then they're going to probably get platelets to get their platelet count up to a more acceptable level before that procedure so that they don't bleed as much during the procedure. So for example, let's say they're going to be having a bronchoscopy. They would probably get platelets if their platelet count is around 30,000 or below because there's risk for bleeding with that procedure. Central line placement, maybe around 20,000 or less. Most surgeries, if the platelet count is 50,000 or less, they're going to probably get bumped up with some platelets before they go to surgery. And same with the lumbar puncture, about 50,000. So it will depend on the procedure, on the MD's preference, on their comfort level. So don't be surprised if you have platelets ordered pre-procedure for something that could be invasive and cause bleeding. If you work in an oncology department or a medical ICU, you will be giving a lot of platelets. I certainly have in my time in the medical ICU. Now, the volume of one unit of platelets is about 60 mils. Next, we have fresh frozen plasma or FFP. So plasma is the non-cellular component of the blood and it is removed from whole blood when we create PRBCs and freeze them. So we pull the plasma out and we are left with the PRBCs on one side and the plasma on the other. The key component of plasma are those coagulation factors. So we give FFP to prevent or control bleeding in patients with certain coagulopathies such as factor deficiencies, and DIC. We can also administer FFP to help reverse the effects of warfarin along with vitamin K. One unit of FFP contains approximately 200 to 300 mils, but you'll often see what's called jumbo FFP, which is going to be several units combined together for a total volume of about 600 mils. Next up is cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate is an element of plasma and contains important clotting factors like factor 8, factor 13, fibronectin, von Willebrand factor, and fibrinogen. It's used to control or prevent bleeding in patients who have a fibrinogen disorder, including DIC. It's also used for patients with von Willebrand disease and liver disease. I've definitely given a lot of cryo in my time in the medical ICU because I took care of so many patients in liver failure. One unit of cryoprecipitate, or as we sometimes just call it, cryo, ranges from 15 to 20 mils in volume and is often pooled together into bags containing multiple units. And then we have granulocytes. This is whole blood with the red blood cells and most of the plasma removed. Granulocytes are a type of white blood cell that may be transfused for patients who have overwhelming infection that's not responding well to medication. Note that granulocyte transfusion is not common due to the short viability of white blood cells in order 
for this white blood cell that's been removed from the plasma, in order for that to be effective, granulocytes must be obtained and transfused within a few hours. So collection is very, very difficult. So it's not likely to be something you will see very commonly. Because a granulocyte transfusion is more likely to cause a reaction than simple red blood cells, most patients getting a granulocyte transfusion will likely receive pre-transfusion acetaminophen and diphenhydramine. Okay, and then we have albumin. Albumin is human-derived protein that is created in the liver. It's a component of plasma. And it is used as a volume expander in cases of hypovolemic shock, in cases of hypotension, or as a replacement after paracentesis. Now, while some facilities may provide albumin from a blood bank, I did see somewhere online where it was talking about getting albumin from the blood bank. It is most often supplied in a glass bottle. You go to the Pixis, you pull it out like you do any other medication. Albumin comes in various concentrations, such as 5%, 20%, and 25%. So you always want to check that you're pulling the correct bottle. Common volumes for albumin bottles are 50 mils and 100 mils. So giving albumin is not going to be the same process as giving a full-on blood transfusion. I included it because it is a component of plasma and students do ask about it quite a bit. Note that patients who traditionally decline whole blood products based on their religious views, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, may accept plasma derivatives, including albumin, also including cryoprecipitate, immunoglobulins, and clotting factors. So you just have to have those conversations with your patients to see if they're willing to accept these plasma derivatives. So now let's move on and talk about the actual blood transfusion itself. So step one, we're going to prepare our patient. So when you're giving blood, the infusion of any blood product must begin within 30 minutes of acquiring it from the blood bank. So you want to do all these preparatory things in advance before you go and get the blood or send someone to go and get the blood. Note that if you obtain a blood product from the blood bank and you are unable to start the infusion within that 30-minute time frame, like let's say you forgot to check that you had a patent IV. You send someone down to the blood bank. They come back with your blood. You go and you want to hang the blood and you go to flush the IV and it's not patent and you can't get another IV started. So you have to call IV therapy, but they can't get there for 45 minutes. Well, now you aren't going to be able to infuse your blood and get it started in that 30 minute time frame. So it's not like you can just go and take the blood and put it in the fridge in the bedroom. You have to return it to the blood bank. It has to be stored in a blood bank refrigerator. If you go past this 30 minute mark, then the blood has to be discarded and you don't ever, ever want to waste a blood product. So do all your prep work ahead of time. So the very most important thing you can do is ensure that informed consent has been obtained and that that signed consent form is in the chart. Now, if it's an emergency situation and no one is available to consent for the patient, the physician will document this in the medical record and the transfusion will proceed. Now, with informed consent, this involves the physician explaining the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, all of those things that you tell a patient before they get any kind of procedure. The patient is, of course, given the opportunity to ask questions and has the right to refuse treatment as they do with anything. So you want to ensure informed consent has been obtained. You also want to explain the procedure to the patient. If there's anything that wasn't covered in the informed consent that you think would be helpful for the patient to know, you want to make sure they understand, make sure they know why they're getting the transfusion, how it will be performed, who's doing it, how long it will take, what type of blood product they're getting, how you monitor for adverse reactions, all of those things. And then you also want to make sure that they know which symptoms to report to you, such as itching or difficulty breathing. You want to make sure they know that that's important and they have to alert the nurse. 
You also want to confirm that the type and screen has been completed. This is a lab test that confirms the patient's blood type and screens for any known antigens. If a type and screen has been conducted, the patient will be wearing a transfusion number or a blood, we call it a blood band in my hospital. This screening must have taken place within three days of the transfusion. So always ensure that your type and screen is current. So if you've got a patient who's in the hospital for a long time and they're occasionally or regularly getting transfused, you're basically drawing a type and screen on this patient every three days. Now, you might be asking, what's the difference between a type and screen and a type and cross? The type and screen has to do with looking at the patient's blood, and then the type and cross is done when they find a bag of blood in the blood bank and think that it's going to be a good match for the patient. They cross-match it against the patient to make sure that it's going to be a good match. And when your blood is ordered, it's going to include that cross-match component. So that will be done down in the lab. You also want to confirm that your patient has a patent IV no smaller than a 22 gauge, though an 18 to 20 gauge is actually preferred as it provides optimal flow rates while being pretty well tolerated by the patient. Bigger size IVs like a 14 gauge or a 16 gauge would provide better flow rates, but those are big and they're not going to be as comfortable. Now, however, if you have a trauma situation where you're doing a massive transfusion, or for any reason you're doing a rapid or massive transfusion, a larger gauge needle will be preferred, like that 14 gauge or that 16 gauge, probably most likely a 16 gauge. A 14 is absolutely, it's like a garden hose in your arm, I'm telling you. So the pediatric sizes are going to be smaller. I'm talking about adult patients here. You also want to administer any PO medications that are ordered as pre-meds, as we call them, and those will be given 30 minutes prior to the transfusion. And then if you have any IV pre-meds, you would give those right before the transfusion is about to start. So some common pre-medications are acetaminophen and diphenhydramine. You also want to perform a baseline assessment of the patient that includes assessing skin color, you're assessing lung sounds, you're assessing for the presence of a rash. Ask the patient if they currently have chills or itching or if they've noticed a rash, if they have muscle aches or any difficulty breathing. All of these are signs of a transfusion reaction, but of course could be also related to other issues. So you need to be able to determine if these symptoms were present before the transfusion or started after the transfusion was initiated. Okay, so we've done our prep work. We're feeling pretty good. Next, we're going to gather and prepare our equipment. So again, before going down to the blood bank, let's get all of our stuff together. So we're going to choose the appropriate IV tubing. So blood tubing is a specific type of IV tubing. And there's two kind of subtypes of this. There's going to be one type that allows you to flow in by gravity. And it also has a little bulb on it so that you could squeeze the blood in faster if you needed to. And then the other type is for use with an IV infusion pump. Both types will have two spikes on it. So one spike goes into the blood product and one spike goes into a bag of normal saline. And we use that normal saline as the flush. And that is the only solution that you use with blood products, 0.9% sodium chloride. Okay, your blood tubing also will have a filter, and that filter eliminates clots and other debris before the blood product enters the patient. And then most facilities have a limit of using IV tubing for two transfusions only, and typically that's two back-to-back -back transfusions. So if you're ever in doubt, obtain new IV tubing, and if you know your IV tubing was used, like let's say you have an order to transfuse three PRBCs, or three units of packed red blood cells. In my facility and in many facilities who have this same policy, you can use the IV tubing for the first two, but then you would get a fresh set for that third transfusion.
You'll prime that tubing with your 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline. And if you're using an IV pump, set up the IV pump in advance. And then you'd have, you know, you'd make sure that you have your saline flushes, your alcohol pads, your gloves, the things that you're going to use when you actually hook up the IV tubing to the patient. Now we're going to prepare to administer the blood product. So before administering blood products, you want to inspect the bag to ensure that the unit of blood is suitable for transfusion. Look for any tears. Look for any leaking from the bag. Look for any discoloration, clumps, or gas bubbles. Anything abnormal is going to be caused to not give that blood product and contact the blood bank immediately. So then you're going to be doing some safety checks, and these are conducted in coordination with another RN, with each person verifying every step independently. And this process could vary slightly from facility to facility, and the order that you do them in may vary as well. So always just follow your facility or your school's protocols and procedures. Please take care to go through each step carefully as the risk for blood transfusion reactions increase when the RN does not follow facility procedures, and it also increases when inexperienced personnel do these transfusions. So having that two-person verification helps mitigate some of this risk. So you're going to verify the patient's identity by checking their medical ID bracelet and asking them their name and birth date if they're available to participate in this conversation. You also want to verify the order, which should indicate the type and amount of blood product to be infused. Some orders may specify a time such as prior to an invasive procedure, but most will be to infuse ASAP or STAT, depending on the patient's condition. You'll confirm that informed consent has been signed and that this is in the medical record. You'll verify the blood product identification number. It will be on the unit of blood and on a tag attached to the bag. You'll verify the patient's blood type when applicable, including the RH factor, and verify the blood type of the blood product when applicable and that it is all compatible one with the other. You'll verify the expiration date on the blood product, and you'll verify the transfusion ID number against the patient's blood transfusion ID number on their wristband or what we call a blood band at my facility, and you'll make sure that these numbers match. This is going to be a unique number for that patient's most recent type and screen, and it will be changed when a new type and screen is drawn. Many facilities will require scanning of different components of the blood product, and you'll do this in the electronic medical records. So you'll be scanning the blood products and the patient's wristband, and then probably manually putting in that blood band number. So speaking of blood compatibility, we'll be looking at that when we are determining if we have the appropriate blood product for our patient. So for red blood cells, we're looking at the patient's ABO blood type and the donor's ABO blood type, as well as the RH compatibility. So RH negative patient must receive RH negative red blood cells. An RH positive patient could receive RH positive or RH negative red blood cells. And then As for the ABO type, type A patient can get type A and type O blood. A type B patient can get type B and type O blood. The type AB patient can have just anything. So they could have AB blood, they could have A blood, they could have B blood, and they can have O blood. This is called the universal recipient. And then a patient with type O blood is going to only be able to receive type O blood. And you'll notice that all of these patients can receive O blood because type O people are considered universal donors. As for plasma, the ABO typing and compatibility is going to be the same as it is for red blood cells, but RH matching is not required for plasma. And then with platelets, it's preferred 
if the patient can have the same ABO type as the donor, but it is not required. RH matching is also preferred, but in cases where it's not possible, if there's shortages or things like that, it may not always be necessary. And then with cryoprecipitate, the same ABO type is preferred, but not required, and RH matching is not required for cryoprecipitate. So I know I'm putting a lot of facts out there to you right now, which is why if you really want to have a great resource for this, I would love for you to sign up for Power Guides because I've got a great downloadable study guide with all of these tables and information in it. So I'll put a link to that in the episode notes, or you can go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash power guides. Okay, so we pretty much have our blood ready to give. If you are using a blood warmer, by the way, you would get that all set up in that blood warmer device. A blood warmer is going to be used to prevent hypothermia when you're giving a large amount and especially a large amount of a rapid transfusion and that blood is cold. It just came out of the fridge, right? So we'll be using this a lot in the trauma units and you'll be seeing it a lot in the emergency department, but you could see it in other facility um, departments as well. Note that the warmer must not heat the blood above 40 degrees Celsius, and this is to avoid hemolysis. Okay, we're going to begin our transfusion finally. So just prior to starting your transfusion, take your patient's baseline vital signs. You're going to be comparing these as you go through the blood transfusion because that's one way that we notice a transfusion reaction when there's a change in vital signs. You'll perform hand hygiene, put on your gloves, scrub the hub of the patient's IV, and connect the blood tubing. Hopefully, you did your prep and you've ensured that you have a nice patent IV. This is not the time when you want to discover that your IV isn't working. And then you'll initiate the blood transfusion at a slow rate for the first 15 minutes. And this is generally going to be somewhere between 50 mils per hour and 100 or 120 mils per hour. It depends on the patient's condition and your facility protocol. I generally start it pretty slow because I want to be super careful and watch for a transfusion reaction. So whatever rate your school or your facility tells you, that's the slow rate that you're going to start it with. Now, in an emergency, would you maybe start it closer to that 100 or 120 mils an hour? Probably, quite possibly. Again, it depends on the patient. It depends on your facility protocols. The key here is that you're staying with the patient for the first 15 minutes. You do not leave. You're observing closely for any signs of a transfusion reaction. And then at that 15 minute mark, set a timer so you don't miss it, you're taking another set of vital signs. Once you're confident that the patient is tolerating the blood transfusion without any adverse effects, your facility protocol will likely include increasing that flow rate of the blood product. And note that the rate that you raise it to, it might be dictated by your facility. It might be based on patient conditions. Some patients are going to need it to be infused more slowly because maybe they have heart failure and have a hard time handling a lot of volume. So, As you're determining the rate at which to infuse your blood product, you have to be very aware that there is a time limit on how long you can take to infuse the blood product. So for example, for packed red blood cells, I believe it's three or four hours in most facilities. So you have to take that into account. Now, during the transfusion, ensure the patient knows when to alert you, like, They're going to alert you if they start itching, if they notice any hives, if they have any difficulty breathing. And you're going to be checking in on the patient periodically, at least every 30 minutes. As you're checking in on the patient, you're monitoring for reactions. You're also monitoring for signs of fluid volume overload, especially if you're giving rapid transfusions or a lot of transfusions, a lot of volume. Signs of overload include shortness of breath or dyspnea, increased work of breathing, coarse lung sounds, and tachycardia. 
Okay, once the transfusion is complete, let's say everything went according to plan, your transfusion has finished, you're going to flush the IV line, so flush the whole line through with normal saline so you get every drop of that precious blood product, and you'll take another set of vital signs to compare against the patient's first two vital sign measurements. And you might think, whew, we're out of the woods, no reactions. Well, I hate to tell you this, but reactions can occur after the transfusion is complete. Acute reactions can occur, of course, during the transfusion. They can also occur within the 24 hours following the transfusion. And then delayed reactions can occur up to four weeks later. Now, they can also occur within hours, but just so you know, they can occur up to four weeks weeks later, depending on the type of delayed reaction. So what are we going to do when a reaction occurs? Now, they are not super common, but they do occur. While many are mild, some are life-threatening and require swift recognition and treatment. So signs of a reaction include a fever, a temperature that is above 38 degrees Celsius or higher, or an increase by one or more degrees Celsius from baseline is considered a fever reaction. The patient may have chills, the skin may be flushed, have a rash, be itching, and have hives. For the respiratory system, they may have wheezing or shortness of breath. They may have tachycardia or hypotension or both. Neurologically, they could have a feeling of unease, of anxiety. They could be dizzy. They may have nausea, have abdominal pain. There could be pain at the IV site, chest pain, flank pain, back pain, and there could be dark or blood-tinged urine, and I'll try to pronounce this, hemoglobinuria, basically blood in the urine. So in general, the most common signs that you'll see are fever, chills, itching, and hives, okay? Other signs such as that respiratory distress I mentioned, the blood in the urine, low blood pressure or hypotension, and a very high fever can indicate a much more severe reaction has occurred. So if an acute transfusion reaction occurs, you're going to stop the transfusion and notify the provider and the blood bank. Now, in some cases of a mild reaction where they have only maybe, say, like a slight temperature rise, the MD may prescribe acetaminophen, or if they have a little bit of itching, they may prescribe some diphenhydramine and instruct you to resume the infusion once they've deemed that it's not anything serious. If this is the case, the infusion should be infused slowly with very, very close observation of the patient and only after you've given those medications. In severe reactions, you'll disconnect the blood tubing from the patient. Do not flush the IV line. You don't want to put any more blood product into the patient that could further potentiate their reaction. You'll immediately acquire additional or alternate IV access, and you'll return that blood product to the blood bank. So let's talk a little bit about the basics of acute transfusion reactions. So a febrile non-hemolytic reaction is the most common type of reaction. It will typically be present when there's a one degree rise in temperature from that baseline measurement. This patient is likely to receive acetaminophen. And again, when the MD deems that the reaction is not severe, the transfusion will likely be continued. There's also an allergic reaction. This is due to an allergy to some protein in the donor blood. It can range from a mild reaction all the way up to anaphylaxis, though thankfully anaphylaxis is rare. In most cases, it is mild and does not require disruption of the transfusion as it will typically respond well to diphenhydramine. Of course, you would be alerting the MD that your patient is having an allergic reaction anytime you see any signs of an allergic reaction like the itching and the hives that I mentioned before. And then we have the acute hemolytic reaction. This is serious. Unfortunately, it often results from ABO incompatibility due to clerical error. That is why those two independent safety checks are so, so important. The patient can show signs of extreme distress, including hypotension and shock, 
blood in the urine, nausea, vomiting, pain at the IV site, pain in the flanks, chills, and fever. A delayed hemolytic reaction is essentially going to be the same type of reaction as an acute hemolytic reaction, only it occurs after the transfusion, hours after the transfusion. And then we have a septic reaction. This is a reaction related to contaminated blood products and mostly occurs with platelets because they're stored at room temperature. The patient will show signs of severe infection, including very high fever, chills, hypotension, tachycardia. The patient could also have nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, and cardiovascular collapse. Septic transactions typically occur during or soon after the transfusion is completed. We also have transfusion-related acute lung injury, or trolley. This is a common cause of death related to transfusion reactions and results in acute respiratory distress syndrome, an immune response between donor antibodies and antigens in the recipient causes the release of mediators that result in pulmonary edema and lung injury. The patient will show signs of respiratory distress during the transfusion or within hours of the transfusion. And then we have my favorite, TACO, which is transfusion-associated circulatory overload. This is a consequence. It's not actually my favorite. I just love tacos. But this is a consequence of fluid volume overload. And with this, the patient will have shortness of breath, coarse lung sounds, possibly some edema, all those things that you would expect to see with any kind of fluid volume overloaded state. Okay, so now let's go to the period after the transfusion. So once the transfusion is complete, you'll continue to monitor your patient for signs of reaction because again, those even those acute reactions can occur up to 24 hours after the transfusion and then those delayed reactions can occur hours or up to four weeks later. You'll also assess the patient for signs of improvement. This could be noted by monitoring their labs. Did their hemoglobin come up like you expected? You also would be looking at their blood pressure. Did their blood pressure get better? Did their tachycardia resolve? Is their bleeding slowing down or stopping if you were giving clotting factors or platelets? Do they have improved skin signs, improved level of consciousness? Whatever their clinical situation was before the transfusion, you're hopefully seeing improvements in some of these key areas after the transfusion. So I hope this review of blood product transfusion has you feeling more confident with this very important skill. It's definitely something you will do a lot in the acute care setting, especially if you work trauma in the ER, in an ICU, on an oncology unit. But of course, blood transfusions will occur at any and all settings in the hospital and in outpatient infusion centers as well. Okay, so before we go, this is something that you're going to be quizzed on very likely in your blood transfusion skills checkoff. So let's check your knowledge of ABO compatibility, okay? So let's say you've got a patient who's getting red blood cells. I'll tell you the patient's blood type, and you tell me what donor types they can receive, okay? All right, so you have a patient with type B negative blood. What kind of blood can they receive? They can receive B negative and O negative. Very good. How about a patient who has O positive blood? What can they receive? A patient with O positive blood could get O negative blood or O positive blood. What about a patient who has AB positive blood? Basically, a patient with AB positive blood could get anything. They could get AB positive, AB negative. They could get A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative, O positive, O negative. That is the true, true universal recipient. What about a patient with A negative blood? 
A patient with A negative blood can receive A negative blood and O negative blood. And then what about a patient with AB negative blood? So an AB negative patient can receive AB negative, A negative, B negative, and O negative. Okay, very, very good. Just a quick little pod quiz for you to test your ABO compatibility knowledge. Again, I've got this for you in the power guides. So check the link for that in the episode notes. Okay, so in a few days, we are going to be starting this cool little mini series. And these will be little bonus episodes coming up on Mondays. And I want you to make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast so that you can check those out. So we will have five total mini episodes starting on Monday, okay? And then next Thursday, I'm going to be sharing with you some more secrets of successful nursing students, and I would love to share them with you, so I really hope I see you back here for that. Okay, see you again very, very soon. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing.